Hi everyone, so we're starting the biodiversity and ecosystems dynamics topic today and the first topic that we're going to be having a look at is biodiversity. Biodiversity is really important because it is where we produce our oxygen, our fresh water and our food. We also need biodiversity for the production of resources and raw materials and a lot of the medicines that we use as humans are made from species in an ecosystem. The Amazon, for example, has great biodiversity and a lot of the plants that are in the Amazon are some way incorporated into the medicines that we use today. The biodiversity is also important for the breakdown of waste materials. If we can't recycle carbon, phosphorus and nitrogen, then we can't grow new plants, which means we'd run out of, of a source of food. We also need biodiversity for the availability of natural sites for recreation, like hiking, and also just to appreciate the beauty of nature as well. So in this ecosystem here, we can see that we have oxygen production, we have carbon dioxide being taken in by photosynthesis, we have production of timber that we use for building supplies. We also have a fresh water supply as well, and we also have soil generation, which is really important for growing crops on. There are three types of diversity that we're going to be focusing on today, the first of which is molecular diversity. So in the past, the term species has been rather difficult to define. Attempts have included organisms that share characteristics in common, that they species are able to breed to produce fertile offspring, or that they may share a common gene pool. The modern definition for species is a group of organisms that are alike, that can produce fertile offspring in their natural environment, and they have DNA sequences and genetic makeup that are common among a species. So one of the critical factors for determining whether two organisms belong to the same species is reproductive isolation. So this means that if two animals were to interbreed, they can only produce fertile offspring if they are of the same species. And this prevents a flow of genes between groups. So there are two terms that you do need to become familiar with, genotype and phenotype. So a genotype is related to the genes that that organism possesses. So that's their genetic material. Whereas a phenotype is the characteristics like eye color and hair color that an organism has that is an expression of its genotype. So the genes express the characteristics. So we have genotype, which is expressed by genes and phenotype is the characteristics that the genes code for. When it comes to biodiversity, having greater genetic diversity within a population of, of the same species means that they will have a greater chance to survive. And this is because they it's more likely that uh, an individual in that population will be able to adjust to environmental conditions like disease or flood or drought. So this um, I, concept is known as natural selection, but we won't go into more detail about that. So genetic drift is another term that you need to become familiar with. And this is where a species gene pool, which is all the genes that they have in, in the population of species, shifts from different genotypes, so different genes, due to loss of genes that may be code for blue eyes um, that is lost in the gene pool because those individuals die out. The next type of diversity that's important for population is population diversity. So a population is defined as a group of organisms of the same species. So if you've got um, a bunch of koalas in a tree, that is a population of koalas. So individuals of a population share a common gene pool, which I mentioned before. So this gene pool is just the sum of all the different genes for an individual, for all the individuals in a population. So for example, for the human gene pool, we have genes that code for brown eyes and blue eyes and hazel eyes. Um, and that is our gene pool for that one particular characteristic. So populations um, make up a community, which is what we're going to talk about next. So a community is a combined 
uh, populations of different species in an area at a particular time. So in example, for an example, on a coral reef, you've got communities uh, living, it's a, bu a bunch of different populations like sea turtles and fishes that live together in a community. So members in a community tend to stay in the same area. So if you have, you will have a community in your backyard. So the same birds will tend to visit your garden each day. So these populations are localized and so are the communities. So that does sometimes limit the area of land available for a community to live on. So in this diagram here, we can see that we have five different populations and those five populations exist in what we call a wetland community. So it's important that you understand what an ecosystem is. So an ecosystem is the non-living parts of an environment combined with the living things in a community. So you've, you've got your biotic factors, which includes um, all of these, which are your uh, species, your communities, and then you've got the abiotic factors, which are your water, your nutrients, your sunlight and your temperature. So looking at the hierarchy of things that live or organisms that live on Earth, we have our goldfish, which is one species, which makes up a population. Two or more populations make up a community and then a community plus the biotic and abiotic features makes up an ecosystem and several ecosystems make up this biosphere, which you would have learnt about in year 10. So again, looking at this in an actual ecosystem, we have the organism, then we have multiple organisms that make up a population. We then have multiple po populations to make up the community. We can see we've got lions, vultures, zebras and antelope. And then we've got the abiotic factors as well, like water and land that make up the ecosystem. And these all interact with one another and the environment to make the ecosystem work properly. So some of the interactions that you will see in an ecosystem are these that are listed below. So competitions, so competition is where two populations will compete for the same resource. Uh, you have predation, which is where you have one organism feeding on another and then you have symbiosis as well. And we'll go through some examples of these in the next couple of slides. So in predation, this is where one organism kills and eats another organism. So the attacker, which in this case is the lion, is the predator, and the zebra, which is, is the prey, which is the animal that's being eaten. So competition is where organisms are in competition for one another when they want to obtain the same resource. And this competition can occur between the same species, like we see here with the hyenas fighting over that carcass, and between different species, like the hyenas competing with the lions for the wildebeest. So another type of interaction in an ecosystem is parasitism. And this is where organism, the one organism lives on or in another organism, which is known as the host, to survive. So the parasite usually harms the host, but rarely kills it, as that would be not beneficial to that organism. So another type of parasitism is brood parasitism, which is where birds lay their eggs in another bird's nest, and the invaders compete with the parents' chicks for food. So examples of this include the cuckoo and the cowbird. Another type of interaction is mutualism. This is where two organisms live close together and both benefit. So a really good example of this is um, the clownfish and the anemone. So the clownfish lives in the anemone for out of protection because um, the barbs of the anemone sting and the an anemone gets uh, to eat all of the uh, bacteria off the clownfish. So it's a mutual relationship. Commensalism is another type of interaction where one organism benefits, which is the commensal, and the other one is unaffected. So this strawberry poison arrow frog raises its tadpoles in the leaves of bromeliads. The bromeliads don't actually Im are impacted by this relationship. They are the host in this case, but the uh, frog has somewhere safe to raise its eggs. So in a ecosystem, there are two types of uh, organisms, energy producers and energy consumers. 
So organisms that are able to produce their own energy are called autotrophs. So these are usually photosynthetic plants. They convert chemical energy into, oh, sorry, sunlight energy into chemical energy, which can then be consumed by other organisms. So all other organisms in an ecosystem that don't produce their own energy are known as heterotrophs. And these can be divided into depending on what they eat. So herbivores will only eat plants, carnivores will only eat meat, and omnivores will eat a combination of both meat and plants. So all heterotrophs are called consumers as they have to consume other organisms to obtain their energy. In a community, you will have what are called trophic levels, which are energy levels. You always have autotrophs at the bottom in the first trophic level. And then as you move up to the second, third and fourth trophic level, you move into heterotrophs. These uh, trophic levels pre represent the amount of energy in each level. And you'll see that in, I think, 10% of the energy is actually passed from one trophic level to the next, which is why uh, organisms at the top of the trophic level tend to have smaller populations because there is not a lot of energy to support them. So in terms of putting producers and consumers into trophic levels, you have your producer, which is your autotrophs, and then you have first, second and third order consumers, which are your heterotrophs. So in a community that might look like this, we have our grass at the bottom of the food chain, which is our producer, which is on the first trophic level. We then have a snail that eats the grass. So this snail is a first order consumer, but is on the second trophic level in a community. We then have a lizard that eats the snail. So they are a second order consumer because they've consumed technically two uh, organisms beforehand. To, to get their energy and they're a third trophic level. Then you have the kookaburra that eats the lizard. They're a third order consumer and on the fourth trophic level. Now, the other thing that I haven't mentioned about communities that is really important is the decomposers, which are usually bacterium and fungus. And these convert your carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus back into usable forms so that energy can still be created and plants can grow, which is really important to us as well as humans. So this is an example of, of a couple of food webs. So here we have our producers and our consumers. And then we've got our first trophic level, second trophic level, third trophic level, and fourth trophic level. You can see that the some of these will occupy one or two trophic levels. It's never really as simple as one, two, three, four. Like you can see here that we've got quite a few that are in different levels. The last type of diversity that I want to talk about today is ecosystem diversity. So uh, for a community to occup uh, occupy a space, and this space is called a habitat, a habitat provides an organism with the basic resources that they need to be able to survive. So that could be trees and a river if we're talking about koalas, or it could be open scrubland if we're talking about kangaroos. So species tend to survive in habitats that, and the factors that determine how well they survive include the interactions between the organisms, which you talked about before, the resource availability, the climate, and the impact of human activities. If you don't have enough resources in a community or a habitat, a species can die out. The same goes for climate. If the climate is no longer um, hospitable for that species, they may have to move elsewhere and this could lead to them dying out as well. And human uh, impact activity, uh, human in activities also impact on a habitat. The Great Barrier Reef is a great example of that. Um, we're seeing 98% coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef and that impacts on the ecosystem of the Great Barrier Reef. So ecosystem stability relies on the number of an abundance of species. So if you have a ecosystem that has a large number of different species, it will have high species richness. And an uh, ecosystem that has species richness in it tends to be more stable and is able to recover from disasters like bushfires, flooding and drought. Uh, for example, in Antarctica, the uh, ecosystem there is very, uh, it's not species rich and therefore they're not as good as, they're not, it's not a very stable ecosystem compared to a healthy Australian bushland that has um, a lot of different species living 
in that uh, community.